Hi, everybody, and welcome to the latest podcast for Honors Biology at Desert Ridge High School. I'm Mr. Galladay, and today we're going to be talking about the cell cycle. Uh, as we talk about the cell cycle, we will, of course, be talking about eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells are the cells that we are made of. They're cells that have a nucleus and have internal membranes, uh, and those are very different from prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are cells like bacteria cells that don't have a nucleus and don't have internal membranes. Um, as we talk about the life cycle of eukaryotic cells, we're going to see that it's uh, rather odd and it, uh, it's interesting, but it's very different from our life cycle. Uh, this is part one, uh, and this will be what we call the gap phase, and why it's called the gap phase we'll see very soon. This is a good place to uh, pause and update your table of contents, update the, uh, the organization in your notebook, and of course, as always, you can uh, pause, the, uh, pause the podcast or uh, rewind as you need to. Okay, we're going to start off with a little bit of um, his history, and this is uh, a guy named, this is a picture of a guy named Walter Fleming. Uh, Mr. Fleming uh, was a German biologist who lived and worked in the late 1800s, uh, and he is discredited, he is credited uh, with discovering chromosomes and the process of mitosis. Um, as uh, Mr. Fleming looked, uh, used his microscope uh, and watched cells over a period of time, he noticed that they uh, went through some changes. He noticed that they didn't stay the same, that they went through some rather interesting changes, uh, and as they did so, these rather unusual shaped objects appeared in the uh, where the nucleus was. Uh, since these objects that he saw uh, readily absorbed some stains and absorbed some dyes and therefore had some color, uh, he named them color bodies. Uh, which uh, in the, the Greek is uh, chromosome. And so that was uh, where the term chromosome came from. They are colored bodies. Uh, and so <clears throat> um, he also observed these changes in cells, uh, which he called the cell cycle. He published this work back in 1878. Uh, he lived in Germany, uh, which was not too far from uh, where another uh, scientist was working around the same time, uh, a gentleman who you've probably heard of named Gregor Mendel. Gregor Mendel was working with pea plants, um, and it's rather interesting that these two guys didn't know each other uh, at the time or know anything about each other's work, even though uh, the uh, observations that each made were very important for the other one and, and had a very close relationship. Uh, at the time, they didn't know anything about each other or each other's work. Uh, Mr. Fleming didn't work with pea plants. He looked at the gills of salamanders. And salamanders, as you may know, have these uh, rather feathery looking structures on the side of their head. Uh, they don't have lungs, but these are the gills, and this is how they get uh, oxygen, how they do gas exchange in an aquatic environment. Uh, and so, uh, in honor of Mr. Fleming and, and his uh, salamander discovery, we've got a bunch of salamanders here to. Uh, swim around and uh, move around and anyway. Uh, so very important discovery um, uh, of, of the cell cycle. Well, these are not salamander gill cells. These are uh, plant cells, as you probably can tell. They have a very distinct cell wall uh, and they have this kind of distinct uh, blocky shape. But this is uh, not, too un, uh, not too different from the cells of salamanders. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the nuclei of these cells are all very different. Uh, as we look at some of these, some of these nuclei um, look rather nor normal, right? It's uh, sort of what we think of as a nucleus. Here's another one that looks uh, fairly normal, but then some of them uh, look rather odd. Some of them have these little wormy or noodle looking things on the inside. Uh, and some of them look uh, distinct, distinctly stretched out and very uh, odd looking. So this was the same thing that uh, Fleming noticed uh, and he noticed that they went through a number of changes uh, throughout the, uh, th that the changes happened in a uh, distinct sequence of the cell, of the life of the cell. Um, and so what he 
termed these things, he determ uh, called them, there was one period of time which uh, he called the gap, uh, which this is uh, basically the time, uh, and he noticed most of the time the cell didn't seem to be doing any, anything. Well, later we called this time interphase, uh, and so most of the time of, of this cell cycle, he noticed that the cell was doing absolutely nothing, um, or from what he could tell, it was doing nothing. Uh, and he, so he called this the gap phase. Uh, during the gap phase, the cell just appeared to be sitting there, not doing much of anything at all. And then all of a sudden, it went through a very noticeable uh, difference, uh, which he called mitosis, or the mitotic phase, uh, also called the M phase. So in Fleming's day, we had a gap phase, uh, which he called the G phase. Uh, and then there was a mitotic phase, which he called the M phase. Uh, and during the M phase, we had some very uh, distinct changes that, that took place in the cell. Um, later, uh, we noticed that, uh, that in fact, this gap phase actually had uh, two dis or three distinct parts. Right smack in the middle of the gap phase, uh, we found that it was when the DNA was synthesized or when the DNA was copied. So now instead of having a, uh, a one long gap followed by a mitotic phase or followed by an M phase, uh, this gap, in fact, was divided up into three distinct phases. First, there was a G1 or a gap one phase, uh, part of part of interphase. Uh, so the gap phase was followed by uh, an S phase, which was the uh, the DNA synthesis phase, and then the the S phase was followed by a G2 or a gap two phase. Uh, which then led into the mitotic phase. So interphase, what we call interphase, is actually made of three different parts. If there's a gap one or a G1, there's an S and a G2. And those are all followed by the M phase. Okay, uh, to keep, oh, okay, we're gonna first look at a, at a little picture to, uh, uh, some pictures to um, kind of define our, our terms a little bit. Uh, when we talk about a chromosome, um, it's one thing that does sometimes get confusing is that a chromosome actually con con consists of two identical chromatids, right? So one chromosome uh, contains two chromatids. Uh, each chromatid or chromosome has two telomeres. The telomeres are the, uh, the tips or the ends of the chromosome. So there's a telomere at one end, telomere at the opposite end. Uh, and then the two chromatids are connected in the middle uh, at a location called the centromere. So the centromere of the chromosome is where the two chromatids are connected. Okay. Um, now the chromosome is actually made up of a uh, basically a bundle or a coiled uh, bundle of DNA. Right. DNA has a distinctive uh, double helix shape, which is, uh, as we learned last semester, is the, uh, the base pairs of A's and T's and C's and G's. The DNA is wound around some little protein structures called histones. The histones uh, with the coils of DNA are then themselves coiled, and all of that is coiled again uh, into this big blob, which we call a chromosome. So when the whole chromosome uh, is, is uh, all comes together, all the DNA uh, comes together, it's this big ball of DNA and protein. The protein, of course, are the histones, uh, and it's connected at the centromere. Um, when we, uh, just a, a little reminder that, that DNA actually has, has two forms in the cell. This is a, uh, a slide from, from last semester. Chromatin is the unraveled form of DNA, and chromosomes are the tightly wound bundles of DNA fibers. Uh, an analogy of this is when we have a rolled up newspaper, that's a chromosome. When we completely unroll the, or unravel the, uh, the newspaper, that is chromatin. Uh, another uh, analogy is to look at a piece of yarn, right? Uh, and, and 
yarn, a piece of yarn is like a chromosome. Uh, and then when we tease apart those, all of the individual fibers that make up the yarn, uh, as you probably know, that yarn is made of very teeny, teeny, tiny little fibers, uh, which is kind of like the chromatin. Okay, so here is a picture of our, or a diagram of our chromosome. Uh, and again, it is made of these tightly bundled DNA fibers, which are themselves uh, all bundled up with the, uh, on the, the sprules, the, uh, the sprules which um, uh, are, are made of protein, uh, and they are bound in the, in the middle at a location called the centromere. This is a uh, electron microscope photograph of a, a chromosome, and so we can see the, uh, the, the tightly coiled uh, DNA fibers uh, that all make up this sort of fuzzy looking uh, piece of yarn which we call a chromosome. Okay, so we're going to use a, a chart to keep track of the uh, to keep track of, of our, our various phases that, that we're going to be talking about here uh, and today we're going to be just talking about uh, interphase or the gap phase which is made of a, a G1, an S, and a G2 phase uh, and so we're going to be talking about those three today. Uh, and we'll look at a, uh, a, a diagram, or actually this is a, uh, a, a, a photograph of a, of a living cell. Uh, and one of the things that, that we, we notice is that this is the, this is the nucleus. Uh, and, and we can very distinctly see this, uh, this nuclear membrane uh, around the cell. Um, or I'm sorry, around the nucleus. Uh, there are some kind of lumpy things that are starting to show up in the middle of the cell, but no real distinct uh, chromosomes yet. Okay, so um, our, uh, to, to start talking about this thing, then we have our G1 phase. Uh, and the G1 phase uh, is characterized by uh, the DNA is in the form of chromatin. Uh, and there is only one copy of the, of the, uh, the DNA. Our nuclear membrane is intact. Uh, we have centrioles, of which there is one pair. If you remember, the centrioles are these uh, funny, uh, funny little uh, objects that uh, travel in pairs. Uh, when it is a pair, we call it a, uh, um, a pair of them is also called a centrosome, uh, but uh, individually they're called centrioles. The cell shape is normal. Uh, it is prob the cell is probably growing during the uh, during the G1 phase. At the end of G1, the the the, um, the cell will uh, copy its its DNA. Uh, so the the DNA is still in the form of chromatin. Uh, but the important thing that happens during S phase is that the DNA is copied. Uh, our nuclear membrane is still intact. Uh, we. Uh, the other thing that happens during the S phase is that our centrioles are copied. So by the end of the S phase, we have two pairs of centrioles, or that is to say two centrosomes, uh, and our cell shape is still uh, what we would call a, a normal uh, cell shape. Um, at the end of the S part of interphase, uh, the cell enters the G2 phase, and, and during the G2 phase, um, we now have um, two copies of, of our chromatin. Uh, that's because it was previously copied during the S phase. <clears throat> our nuclear membrane is still intact. And now, of course, because our centrioles were copied, we now have uh, two pairs of centrioles during the G2 phase. Uh, and our cell shape is normal. So if we were to compare what, uh, what has happened during the G1 phase and during the, uh, and the G2 phase, if we were to compare two cells, um, there would be nothing really visible, no real difference. Notice our nuclear membrane is intact. There's no, uh, there's no change to our nuclear membrane. Uh, and our cell shape basically looks the same. So this is why to Walter Fleming, uh, he called it a gap phase. There was nothing that he could physically see uh, that took place. But we now know that something very important is different. If we were to measure the amount of DNA present uh, during G G1 uh, and then measure the amount of DNA during G2, we would see that there was twice as much DNA. And that's because 
uh, during the S phase, the DNA was copied. The DNA was, uh, we, we got a, uh, a second copy of the DNA. Okay, so that brings us to the end of, of interphase. Um, and at the end of interphase, this is what our cell would look like. Uh, this is our um, cell membrane, which, we, which is a little bit faint in this picture, but our, uh, our, our, our cell membrane is out, out here. So this is our, uh, this is our, our normal uh, looking cell. Uh, here is our nuclear membrane, which in this uh, diagram is very distinct. Um, and uh, we don't yet have any distinct chromosomes, but we are starting to get some kind of lumpy looking things uh, taking place there in the middle, and those will become uh, distinct very soon. So at this point, uh, we've completed our G1 phase, uh, which is the gap one. We've completed our S phase of interphase, and we've completed our G2 or our gap phase. Uh, that's the end of this podcast, and during our next podcast, we'll be talking about the, uh, the M or mitotic phase. This is Mr. Galladay for Honors Biology at Desert Ridge High School, and I hope you have a great day.